Okay, so, Lena, I think most people would accept that scientists are engaged in the practice of explaining the world, but you are a philosopher of science, and your interest is in explaining explanation itself. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if we could talk a bit about what that project is. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. So I think it's actually an excellent question, what exactly that project is. Um, Partly because I think philosophers have been doing a few different things when they think of themselves as engaged in explaining explanation. Mm. One is to try to provide an account that is from a philosophy-first account, so just think about it and come up with a philosophical account and see whether or not things fit that. Yes. But there's another approach, which is the one that I've taken, which is to try to look at examples from a history of science, um, where it looks as if though we have um, debates over explanatory standings, seeing what we think is at stake in those debates and mm. trying to identify what seems to be sort of the crucial driving components of whether or not you have an explanation. Okay, so That's you're looking at, kind of, at, at historical examples of, of scientists arguing about whether the explanations in front of them are good ones yeah. and trying to draw out what criteria they're using. Yeah, so exactly, or at least what criteria they are um, trying to track. So whether or not they themselves think of these criteria in exactly that way, okay. that's not always so clear. But at least trying to account for how what they are saying seems to be tracking something like this criteria, making that clearer. Okay. So that's, that's part of the project. Okay. So um, you're certainly not the first philosopher to think about uh, giving an account of explanation. Mm-hmm. Um, is it right to say that there are sort of two main stabs at that in the literature you're looking at? So I focused m- mostly on uh, causal accounts of explanation. Uh, and on an account known as the deductive nomological account of explanation. Now, that account is most closely associated with um, Hempel, and um, it starts off, I think, in a way that uh, seems very compelling, but quickly ran into troubles that paved the way for the causal account. Okay. So the idea behind the deductive nomological it's a long thing to say, so typically we shorten it to DM, <laughs> DM model of explanation, okay. um, is that to explain is to have an argument of a certain kind, a deductive argument, Mm -hmm. um, that essentially makes use of at least one law of nature. So really what you're doing, more sort of informally speaking, is that you are deriving some phenomenon that you're interested in from a law of nature, and that's how you explain it. Okay. Um, And if you open a sort of physics textbook... Um, that looks like a really good account. That's what it seems as if we're up to all over the place. We're starting with some basic principles and we're trying to derive various consequences of those principles plus some other assumptions that you typically need uh, and thereby accounting for various things that we see around us. Uh, right. So, so for example, um, if you're trying to predict the motion of the planets, yeah. um, then you would have the initial conditions where the planets are now yeah. and you'd have the laws of motion. Yeah. Um, and you would deduce from those two kinds Mm -hmm. of inputs where they would be in the future. So that's why it's the deductive nomological model. Yeah, Yeah. that's exactly right, yeah. Um, And the way you used it here, you actually have put your finger on um, one aspect of the deductive nomological model, that on the DN model, it looks like prediction and explanation uh, are very similar. Right. So the way you put it now is that we predict the future position of the planets. Now, you might also think that you explain why the planets have moved the way they do using the very same laws. Okay. And it looks like prediction and explanation are very closely linked on the DM model. Um, and in fact, that's one of the things that the causal account comes along and criticizes the DM model for. Okay. Um, so there are lots of um, the sort of range of problems with the DM model. The one that uh, I have found the most compelling and the most interesting of them uh, is one that has to do with the directionality of explanation, uh, so that sometimes it's the case that we can use laws of nature plus some particular facts to predict some other particular fact, mm-hmm. uh, but we don't take that to be an explanation. Right. Uh, although sometimes we do take it to be an explanation, and the question now is, why? Why is it the case that the direction of explanation runs from these particular facts to these particular facts, but not vice versa. Okay. Even so, though prediction looks like it can run both ways. Um, so do you have an example of that? Yeah. So 
uh, something that I imagine that um, uh, kids in the UK get to do as well is to be sent out to try to calculate um, height of flagpoles or towers from shadows right. or sticks measuring things at various times. Now, it turns out that when you are studying the trigonometric relations that you apply to do that, mm-hmm. um, you quickly learn that you can either start from the length of the shadow of a flagpole, say, uh, and the angle that the sun makes with the horizon Mm -hmm. to calculate the height of the flagpole. Or you can start from knowledge about the height of the flagpole and the same angle to calculate the length of the shadow. Right. But the calculation can go in both ways. If you do that, it looks as if you're using the same law-like relation Mm -hmm. um, to be able to predict in both directions. You can predict the height of the uh, flagpole from the length of the shadow, Mm -hmm. or you could predict the length of the shadow from the height of the flagpole but only one of the directions looks as if though it's explanatory. So it looks as if though you could explain the length of the shadow using the height of the flagpole, but you can't really explain the height of the flagpole using the length of the shadow. Right. Um, now, the causal account steps in here and says that what the DM model has left out is that what's crucial for explanation is that you're providing information about the causal history of the phenomena you're interested in. So the height of the flagpole is part of the course of the shadow, mm-hmm. uh, but the shadow is not part of the course of the flagpole. So um, the problem with the DN account mm-hmm. is that um, it's just about expectability as opposed to mm. um, dependence. What, what, mm-hmm. what, what factors depend on what other factors? Yeah, so I think that's a great way of putting it. The problem with the DN model is exactly that. The DN model seems to take explanation to just be a matter of expectability from laws. And that seems to be too broad. Um, We get many cases of prediction that aren't telling us about explanatory dependence. Mm -hmm. Now, the causal account then steps in and says that uh, what matters is whether or not you're tracking causal dependence in the world. So the shadow causally depends on the the flagpole, but not vice versa. Right. Now, one of the worries with... um, the causal account that I have had. So I just see that the causal account is by and large popular in the literature. There, there are some worries that come about just from restrictions in how far it can apply. So people worry about cases in mathematics, for example, mm-hmm. where you might think that you have explanations, but it's not plausible to think that you have causal relations. Right, right. But I actually have a much more um, base level worry <laughs> about causal explanations. And this comes because I think that the DN model was right by saying that in plenty of examples throughout the sciences, particularly in physics, Mm -hmm. uh, we really are explaining by stipulating what the basic principles are and deriving phenomena from them. And we just are not worrying about whether those are causal cases. Right. Physics is about laws of nature. Everyone knows. <laughs> well, yeah. So at least large parts of the sciences, I think, really are about laws of nature. They're mm. not about discovering causes. Okay. So we've said that the DN model, the problem with that is that it's just about expectability and it gets the directionality of explanation wrong in, in, in the shadow explaining the flagpole. Yeah. And the problem with the causal account is it's just not... Um, all-encompassing enough, and there's plenty of physics that seems to get on pretty well without mm-hmm. looking for causes. Mm-hmm. Um, so how on earth do we reconcile these accounts? Yeah, um, yeah. No, I think that's a, a great question. So part of my work has been trying to solve those kinds of problems for a law-based account of explanation. Okay. So that's not trying to rule out that you can explain using causes. Okay. It's just trying to say that you don't need to make this claim that the way to solve the problems for the DN account is by making causes rule supreme within the domain of explanation. Okay. So the way that I have done that is to pay attention to the conditions of application of the laws in question. So the understanding that you have to develop of when a certain law-like principle applies or not is going to be crucial for giving us um, the directionality of explanation back again. So in the shadow... And in uh, flagpole case, the way that I think we have to think about that is that when we apply the trigonometric relation, 
we know that there are certain conditions that have to be fulfilled in order for that application to be appropriate. Right. So in particular here, really basic things like there has to be a light source. Um, it's a bad idea to try to do this in the middle of the night. Okay. You know, it's so obvious that we wouldn't necessarily uh, even always spell it out. Mm. Um, uh, but nonetheless, it's something that we know. We know roughly when it's appropriate to apply this law-like principle to try to understand the system and when it's not. Mm -hmm. um, now, this matters because when you take that into account, we can ask questions that have to do with dependence to so recover some of the ideas from the causal account without tying them to causal notions specifically. Okay. So we can ask questions like this. Uh, is the length of the shadow sensitive or not to whether or not the total application of the law had been different from the way it actually is? So, so for example, uh, is the length of the shadow uh, sensitive to variations in the variables in the law itself, like the height? Mm -hmm. And it is. Mm -hmm. Uh, but we can also ask, is it sensitive to whether or not conditions like whether or not there is a light source present are fulfilled? Right. And the shadow is. Okay. Now, you might be able to start to see how this is going to go. If you look at the other side, the side that we wanted to rule out as being explanatory, mm -hmm. we now have to ask, according to the law that we're using, um, is the height of the flagpole sensitive to variations in the length of the shadow and it looks like at least according to the principle we're using it says that it is mm -hmm. but we also have to ask is the height of the flagpole sensitive to variations in the conditions that have to be fulfilled in order to apply that principle right. such as the presence of a light source and we're going to answer no because it's there all night. They're there, it's there all night. It doesn't <laughs> exactly. It doesn't matter whether there's a light source present or not. So I think what breaks the symmetry um, is the fact that even though the law itself, just looking at the law, yes. uh, seems to say that derivation goes both ways. When we're looking for dependence, we're not just concerned about um, having a derivation in a single case. Remember the DN model? Right. It's enough that we have certain facts mm. and we have a derivation from a law. Uh, that means that we can just look at the cases where there is a light source, there is a, okay. um, a flagpole, there is a shadow. Uh, but once you move to dependence, you're starting to ask, how would things have been different had some of those conditions been different? Right. And it turns out that the height of the flagpole isn't sensitive to the conditions of application, like there being a light source being different, but uh, the um, length of the shadow is. Okay. And okay. that's what I think accounts for the difference. Um, so just to sum up, um, you have taken from the DN model the focus on laws, mm -hmm. um, but abandoned kind of mere expectability yeah. in favour of dependence, yeah. which you get from causal accounts. Mm -hmm. But um, you borrow dependence without borrowing causes themselves. You left causes behind from that account. That's exactly right. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> that's exactly what I've um, been trying to do.